uh, it's my great honor and pleasure actually uh, to introduce Professor Michael Barrett uh, from the University of Cambridge. He's the director uh, from research and also uh, professor of information systems and innovation studies at the Judge Business School. He's also the academic director of uh, Cambridge Digital Innovation. And his research interests include the adoption and use of digital health and the role of digital innovation in facilitating financial and social inclusion. He's currently also the editor in chief of information and organization, an, an academic world renowned journal. And he has a large trajectory working on innovation and financial strategies with governments and corporations alike for several years. Today, he will actually share with us his expertise and experience related with uh, local innovation and how we can scale it thanks through the use of digital innovation with the goal of achieving inclusion. At this stage, and before I give the word to Michael, to Professor Michael Warrett, I would like to remind the audience uh, that you are welcome to ask questions at any time using the Q&A section uh, in, the, in the lower part of your screens. Michael, welcome. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Matthias. I, I appreciate the very warm welcome uh, from you and all the colleagues uh, that have just spoken. It's a fascinating and tremendous program. I'm, I'm just so sorry I'm not able to be there when you're presenting uh, all the, the solutions, uh, but I look forward to hearing more. And the, the, the discussion around collaboration and the volunteer work is, is so critical. Uh, and so it's an area that I would love to, to, to learn more and to, to be involved with at some point. Right now, I'm going to share my screen uh, and, and I have some slides I'd like to use for the presentation, uh, which I believe you can now see. Uh, again, it's a, it's, a, it's a great privilege for me to be this, the plenary speaker at this forum, the UNESCO SILAC forum. And uh, indeed, for me, the, the, the talk, when, when Matthias asked me if I would, uh, would, would give it, it, it speaks to an area of both interest and passion over, uh, over the last decade. And, and not so much in the area or the geography of the Latin, Latin America and the Caribbean, though I am from the Caribbean, I'm Jamaican, but I've been working in the area of, in Africa, different parts of Africa, in particular Kenya, over the last number of years. And so I thought what I would do today is to share some experiences and insights from that work and how it may be helpful for you going forward. So I'm going to look at specifically, uh, and this has been mentioned uh, just by, by a number of the, the speakers beforehand, the, the very importance and the power of, of FinTech, in this case, we look mobile money innovation to address the inequalities of financial ex exclusion. And indeed, uh, the, there is one thing to develop a solution, and that's very important. And, and the work that you've been doing now over several months will pay off. It's hard work. Uh, we also do design sprints as, as part of our programs, and they're very important to get things going. And, and I know there's a lot of good knowledge and development through the accelerators and the like that, that, that you've been engaged with. And I thought what I would try to do is to, to share a little bit, as Matthias mentioned, around the scaling aspect. Because what I found is that, that that's a big challenge is, is how do you actually uh, think about solutions as they are developed, uh, how you try them out, how you experiment and how you remember that, that they, the local innovation remains absolutely critical. And so I'm going to, uh, to, to first of all, talk about uh, a, a financial, I'm sure many of you will have known, know about the Impesa mobile platform. And I'm going to just share some experience around the development of that and draw out a few lessons. And then I'm going to look at how it's been uh, both scaled within different parts of Kenya uh, around Megeta Island and, and then in other neighboring uh, sub-Saharan African countries, uh, Tanzania, and then also in South Africa, very briefly, obviously, given the short time we have today. Then I want to talk a little bit about how do we... Um, 
see the new opportunities as you've been doing over the last several months uh, to, to look at how uh, local innovations around mobile money can provide for social inclusion, particularly with respect to clean energy and more and more recently su supporting climate action is a, an area of focus that I've started to be looking at with colleagues. And then I would like to link those a little bit to the SDG. I think it's a fantastic theme that you've got there in terms of connecting into the uh, sustainable development goals. Uh, and then I wrap up with a, a few concluding thoughts. So some hopefully some insights that, that come out of the, the different cases uh, around scaling over the years. So just to start with, what we see here is, uh, you know, as, as, as I mentioned, it, it, it is still a massive challenge, uh, financial exclusion. And, and the size of the red dots highlight just the scale of the problem. Uh, indeed, you know, we, we can see, you know, countries, India and China are, are very, very still large areas are, are financially excluded. And indeed, Latin America and the Caribbean, certain parts of Latin America is still a very, very important challenge, as many have mentioned already today. And so globally, this is a very critical and important area where we can learn collaboratively across different regions uh, where work is being done and try to locally contextualize appropriately uh, those lessons to be effective in, in developing solutions and innovations. And the, uh, this graph here just highlights very briefly the uh, dark blue is, is where I've been spending more time, sub-Saharan Africa. And, and we can just see the, the, the evolution and the growth. But we also see in the crimson, a uh, dark red is the Latin America and the Caribbean, where there has been extremely strong growth as well of, of global money uh, over the last, sort of eight, in this case, the, this is the 18 year period. And when we drill down, and I, 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 I looked into this for the talk, but and, you know, you're very familiar with it perhaps, but I was uh, very impressed with the, the level of growth uh, from, of mobile money, which we're seeing there, a significant number of registered accounts up by 39%, uh, and, and, and indeed the transaction volumes uh, similarly around 35%. So, really, really strong growth in, in the region and an extremely important topic. And, and, and during COVID, people, we've been mentioning the very um, difficult times and indeed, I, you know, around the world that we've all experienced. Uh, and, and, and in many ways, mobile money with its contactless character has been incredibly important for, for helping to support business. And so we've seen a very important growth here, a positive impact in Latin America and the Caribbean of 67%. Uh, so it's, a, you know, it, even in these difficult times, increasingly important that, that, that we see how mobile money uh, and FinTech more generally uh, as innovations are developing and scaling. I want to share with you a little bit about, again, as some research uh, with colleagues from the left, Ava Oborn, who's at work, business school in the UK, and, on, uh, and then myself, and then Vonda Olikowski, who's at MIT, and then Anna Kim, who's at McGill uh, in Canada. And, and we, as a sort of a, an international team, so to speak, have been looking at different aspects of, of the trajectory dynamics of, of innovation and understanding how and why mobile money services might develop and transform as they move over time into different geographies. And so I want to start with, with Kenya and I want to, uh, you know, locate, uh, you know, I think it was mentioned earlier, one of the speakers around 46% is where Latin America and the Caribbean might be at in terms of not having a bank account. And indeed, when we started this work uh, in Kenya, it was at 90% of people were unbanked. It's, it's really hard to believe the, um, the level of uh, financial exclusion uh, which was there. But at the same time, and you see on the right-hand column, the opportunity was also there, even back in 2006, where we see over 70% at that time had cell phone coverage. Uh, and indeed, on top of that, the mobile network by Safaricom uh, was uh, uh, who had a monopolistic, um, uh, if you like, hold, uh, had, a, had a, a, la a large coverage across the country, you know, uh, very, uh, especially at that time, it was very impressive. But that 
that provided the, the potential for offering digital solutions very early on to address this issue of financial exclusion. And, um, and so what we saw was the, uh, you know, in, in many ways, and, and though different how you're probably looking at what is the, the FinTech challenge, uh, you had at that time Vodafone developing, uh, you know, they actually had just won a, a million pound grant uh, with our de Department for International Development. Uh, it was a match grant, um, which allowed them to start to develop uh, the technology uh, and to think about what would they be offering uh, as a, for financial inclusion as a, a, um, a mobile service became what they looked at. And so what we see here is, is the, the partnering that started off quite early on and the deciding on what might be that future service. What, how does one decide on the, the solutioning that might be most helpful and relevant? Um, they teamed up with a local um, Cambridge actually um, ser digital service company called Sagentia, which is actually very close to where I live, as it happens. And also with their local partner, Safaricom, who uh, they own actually a 10% share in. And so the, the beginnings of trying to develop what was brand new at the time of a financial ecosystem around, uh, if you like, um, a, 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 some sort of a, a, a FinTech uh, using mobile technologies was, was born. And it, it, indeed the, you know, a, a, the idea of microloans came on stream very early on. It, it, really focus or, or the impetus for, for, for the focus on microloans was primarily because of the, uh, the, I would call it the poster child at the time, perhaps Jeff Grimian Bank, who was uh, very successful in microfinancing, supporting microloans. And, and in some ways that, that was started out as a, a way of trying to uh, test uh, this, this, a solution and learn locally by by having it tried out with, in the middle, you'll see there, the FAULU is, is the name of the organization of the fin microfinancing organization. And, and they also started to work closely with the regulators. Very important to be thinking of your wider ecosystem and how you're engaging and getting their support. Fortunately, the, the regulators in Kenya at the time were very supportive of financial inclusion. Uh, so that that, that was um, perhaps offered a lower than usual hurdle for getting things started. And then the, the Commercial Bank of Africa was, uh, was a, an important, uh, if you like, entity to provide the, the bank account because you have, uh, you know, in this case, a mobile network operator looking at developing a solution um, uh, around, uh, in this case, uh, uh, microfinance to start with. Well, what we see happening, and this is where, uh, you know, a lot of the work that you've been doing over the several months around, perhaps, human-centered, as many have mentioned, uh, design thinking, uh, doing design sprints, uh, was, is helpful to understand uh, why that framed opportunity actually turned out to be not very successful after they tried some experiments. So you see it, this is a, some of you may be very familiar with this, uh, this chart, uh, which is from IDEO and experience point, looking at how do we understand the different phases uh, of, of, in this case, uh, design thinking from inspire from the left, ideate in the center and implement over on the right hand side. And, and so the challenge that we all have in terms of what is the future is to define that challenge, which is really best understood uh, at the, and always best understood locally at the bottom left hand corner of the graph in what's called the concrete or in the physical by by doing an understanding, observing, forming insights. Some of the challenges though, and we see a little bit of this with the initial um, it's, it's starting points for the, uh, for, for, for the Impesa story is the focus on perhaps the microloans came from maybe starting too quickly into the ID8 phase, which would be in the middle column. And so maybe, uh, you know, in the talking with um, a number of the colleagues, needing to the pressures of getting started and, and, and solutioning, uh, thinking that that would be what was at that time the, the, the best solution. And, and to their credit, trying it out very, very quickly as an experiment in the bottom right-hand corner and, and learning from the local users 
who came back and said, you know what, for microfinancing, this may this peer-to-peer -peer mobile uh, innovation may not be most effective for many reasons. And in the interest of time, one of the things that was quite critical was that people would come together for meetings, for mutual accountability, and to help support uh, people. If you know one week one person could not make the full loan, then there would be a way of helping. Others would be there to, to shore up that, uh, that, that payment. Uh, and that sort of an approach, groups and meetings, was seen to be critical for what was around 90 to 95% of a, a, a successful loan repayment. And so when people started not coming to the meetings because you could simply pay it off by uh, the, the phone quickly, uh, then that starts to interrupt the social fabric and the, and the, the character that made this the microfinancing successful, uh, or at least contributed as importantly to, to them working out. So what that did was really to, to search again uh, to, as to what really was the challenge that, that was best if it wasn't microfinancing or microloans. And so, you know, whilst one of the things I always say about this picture is that it, it looks squeaky clean and somewhat linear, and, 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 and that's the challenge with it, because whilst it's it indeed helps us understand the different phases in a, in a quite a nice way. It's messy, it's iterative, it's, it, you know, it, it, there's lots of trying loops as you've all done, I'm sure in, in your work, of trying out experiments and re, redefining the challenge and trying to establish the, 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 the real insights that will make a difference. And it was through that painful process over several months and, and also the move for by the lead designers to, to station themselves for six months from both Vodafone and Sagentia with Safaricom, where they best understood the local practices and the issues and the, the way in which uh, a, a mobile service could best meet those that were financially excluded. So very much a process and very much a, a messy and a, a ongoing uh, uh, experimenting type of a, approach. And indeed, over time, with that reframing, experimenting and relaunching, there the, the sort of poster child in some ways of of, of mobile and and uh, sending money home, mobile money transfer, has at least in Kenya revolutionised the way in which uh, there's better access uh, to uh, for financial inclusion. And, and, and the brief stats are, are, are quite outstanding. You know, they, with, within one year of the launch, they had seven times the number of subscribers than they expected. And so for any company designer, it was a huge success. It was the CSR uh, branch of the Vodafone uh, company, along with their partners, which, uh, you know, worked hard to, to, to get this um, active and successful. These, this chart just shows the significant uh, you know, increase in uptake in the first sort of five years, both in terms of the population adopting the service, but also crucially the number of agents, which was really important actually to, you know, to, to have this embedded set of airtime resellers with Safaricom that, that could be retrained uh, to, to scale up the service nationally. Uh, so going from 350, to around 40,000 in five years. And when you think the number of banks in Kenya at the time was about 500, it was a, a significant change in, in offering uh, a solution where all could be, uh, or many, many, many could be included across the country in a very short period of time. And this is a, another slide which just shows the, the different, um, the access and how it's increased dramatically. Um, uh, over the last, you know, 13 years, and it continues to, to thrive, as I've mentioned in an earlier slide. But what I want to get at now is, is, is that's, you know, one of the questions that we kept hearing over the years is, well, you know, how do you actually replicate and, and uh, scale and, and have the same effect of this, uh, in, the, in this wonderful, um, you know, example, how does, how does it happen in other countries, or, and, and if not, why not? And um, you know, one of the things that we explored through the work was, was this emphasis on local innovation and the fact that place really does matter. It's an, an obvious point, but then it's to unpack what 
are the different facets or dynamics of, of how uh, the texture of, of a place interacts with the, the technology or the innovation. So what this diagram is showing is that within Kenya, what we pull out from the analysis is that there are what we see to be four main uh, dynamics of interacting trajectories that develop over time. So once the, the service was developed, it was, it was at the bottom left, we, as we discussed, the, the, the microfinance trajectory was short lived. But then the other aspects of, of why the sending money home work seemed to work so well included the, the fact that the, there is a, a natural or, or historical cultural uh, migration trajectory, which has developed over many decades uh, uh, in people in Kenya from the rural areas going to Nairobi, might be true in many cities uh, within uh, other countries. But this was particularly important as to why uh, the, the scale up seemed to develop so quickly, that urgency of, of getting money back to, to the villages to support it. There's also the, the, the trajectory, the banking trajectory, which is the third one over, which highlights how understanding the local banking practices and why, why people were excluded from getting bank accounts, the poor in particular, uh, having variable uh, you know, amounts of, of, of um, employment, not being able to pay the fees, and indeed not being seen to be, let's per, uh, offering perhaps the most uh, value, valuable uh, revenues. But we also see the, 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 that, uh, and this was very important, the, the level of local innovation and user innovation had spiraled uh, as more and more people took on and built businesses and used the, the platform in ways that were totally unexpected and unintended by the designer at the beginning. This is just an example of, of, of showing the, uh, I love this picture because people are, uh, the empathy of, of addressing a need uh, the, the gentleman on the left being very much maybe in the, an urban, urban setting, city setting, sending money back to uh, parents in, in the villages. Um, but it's meeting a need, a very much a human-centered uh, design would pick this out as being really, really uh, extremely important. Um, as I was saying, with the banking trajectory, what we see here is, and these are some of the quotes from some of the work at the time, is that the, 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 the inequality of banking and, and the availability was, 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 was striking for, for many. Um, just to highlight that on the left, uh, the, the banks, you know, it, it, it's not a place or meaningful for, for those that, you know, are not uh, at that time uh, literate or wealthy. So, very much and on the right hand side was that that quote is quite striking but it highlights the the way in which it was not seen by the poor to be a place where they could have access to the financial system and indeed there are gender issues which as has been mentioned previously by other speakers very much comes out in the the research in in how we you know it offers actually an opportunity for women uh, um, to, to, to be engaged in the system because traditionally with banks, it was, it was very um, male focused as to who could enter uh, that facility. Uh, this, this is uh, just uh, highlighting the, uh, the, the, look, the innovation and showing how, uh, you know, it, it, it very much the last, the very last point, bullet point there, many, many collaborations and partnerships grew up dramatically around the Mpesa platform, whether it was utility business companies, buses, hospitals, uh, you know, paying bail even was a, is an, a, was a, a very funny one where, uh, you know, it, it took on and, and was offered to be used uh, in all spheres of, of life uh, uh, as a way of, of helping support um, uh, people in their work. So now we you know, with, with that sort of short snapshot, the, the take the one key point I want to highlight there is the importance of understanding the 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 the, 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 the tra trajectories of places we call it of of, of what makes the, the local locale distinctive and and how do we then understand why innovation that you develop may uh, have a strong resonance or scaling capability or not? Because even though 
has been hugely successful in Kenya, uh, you know, um, over uh, 15 years now, we don't see the same results uh, across all countries. We see very mixed results. We see some, some good uptake, but nowhere near the same level of scale in Tanzania, which is neighboring to Kenya in sub-Saharan Africa. And we see actually, uh, you know, South Africa, which is a very different demographic, a very different banking system, about twice uh, the investment platform and, and payment system has been introduced in, over, in five years. And in both cases, it had to be withdrawn. Uh, why? Just a, a couple of key points on that. Um, when we look at scaling, the differences between the two. Well, in Kenya, I've, I've mentioned before the, uh, the, 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 the rural urban uh, migration, the, the conducive regulatory environment for financial inclusion, and the way in which there was this distributed agent by this mon monopoly uh, um, mobile network operator that could then, uh, if you like, scale very quickly. Whereas what we see in Tanzania is that we there is very little that first of all there there isn't that security of the transaction which we see at the bottom the national identification card provided that security of transactions in Kenya which was not available in Tanzania and you had much more of an oligopolistic competition so the market structure is very different and interestingly the you know because of a, a 30 years of a, a, a strong socialist government you had actually very strong villagization policies in place, much less urban rural uh, migration or dynamics, and which meant that there was a different uh, level of need and not as strong a need by the consumers for this. I mentioned briefly uh, South Africa, very different again, uh, in terms of uh, understanding the, the way in which uh, the, the uh, uh, what we have is very much a, a strong, almost the first world, um, if you like, um, uh, banking sector, um, which has therefore a number of competing kinds of, of products and, and services, cards, uh, and, and, and also different um, um, re banking regulations, which created a lot of challenges for why uh, you know, M-Pesa um, as a product could or service would not could not take hold very easily. There's of course a lot more, but that's just highlighting a few issues as to why scaling is a challenge in locales with mature banking um, sectors. I, I'm going to actually uh, at this point just highlight a little bit on where we're going as I come to a close and, and to, to 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 examine what I heard one of the speakers talk about, the, the way in which uh, uh, mobile money can help to support different digital services. Uh, we've been looking at clean energy, so helping to provide a loan to support uh, solar panels, to offer lighting and charging of batteries, uh, uh, mobile batteries, as well as engaging with farmers, networks of farmers to provide carbon payments. Uh, around climate action. So we see this on the, the last fishbowl on the right. So in addition to poverty alleviation, there are a myriad of different digital services that um, are developing around the platform. And I, I want to just end uh, with this slide perhaps and to make sure there's enough time for questions and discussion. But what we've been also looking at is how, does, how do we try to understand, uh, you know, as these multiple different services are developing on the back of uh, mobile platforms and mobile money innovations across different sectors for development, how do they map and how are they being effective across different uh, sustainable development goals? And so here are a number of the ones which we are looking at based on the, the, the services that I've just mentioned. Uh, you see that on the right hand side, uh, all the way from poverty alleviation down to reforestation. But I'm, I'm going to leave it at that and actually at, uh, end off with some insights on promoting local innovation. Some things that we've been learning as we've been going through uh, this process of designing. Designing mobile services, uh, it was hinted at by one of the speakers, 
it very much needs a, a very humble approach between the designer and the user in how you engage. If you're going to really understand and listen to the users and see what's valuable in their context, it does require uh, um, a, a willingness to, to, to be patient, to try out, uh, to really uh, value and respect the user and their knowledge base in coming up with the right kinds of services which are most useful. It is great what you're doing in terms of addressing multiple uh, uh, SDG goals. I think it's a, a fantastic opportunity for how we can see mobile services uh, for, for inclusion uh, being effective. I would leave you with trying to understand what are the trajectories of place or the local locale that, that you're looking at. And one of the things that we found, which, which is hard to do, you know, when you strike it big, if you like, if you come across a service that seems to be highly successful, as we see with the, the Kenyan uh, example, it is even though you you went through a, you know a very much a learning journey and you were learning to become open and humble about what's the best service for that context it is incredibly difficult to be to remain humble it is easy to start replicating and saying i've got this sort of uh, golden uh, nugget or approach silver bullet as to what is the service that i should simply scale in all kinds of locales. And I, I warn against that because that is, uh, it, you always need to get back to and start again, even though you've had success on what makes different local contexts distinctive. Uh, and, and also, you know, the South Africa example highlights the way in which not only do you have, to, uh, that you have to consider the, the banking maturity of the context, and you also need to be thinking about, you know, in the case of, of Kenya, where you had uh, the, the, the um, Safaricom offering um, uh, airtime, uh, selling of airtime, and, and some digital maturity around that, 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 these are reasons why scaling may happen uh, for your innovation or not. And um, I, I, I'm so delighted to have heard the earlier comments that were made, because I can see that it resonates very strongly for me as uh, colleagues and myself continue to, to, to look at research on mobile money services and how they can address inequality, which as was mentioned is increasing with our pandemic. And particularly around what sometimes referred to this energy poverty climate nexus, which is a, which if we're not careful becomes uh, not a virtuous circle, but one which degradates over time. Would love to be able to share much more with you, but I'm conscious of time and I do thank you for your attention. I'm happy to discuss further in a Q&A mode. Thank you very much. Michael, thank you. Thank you very much for your insightful uh, presentation. And um, there were a few questions asked, but in order to break the ice, I'll ask the first one. Sure. Uh, because of uh, the program and actually the, the participants as well. Uh, thinking back in, in your slide, the one about defining the challenge, right? Like you have a, a figure there, which I think is extremely relevant actually for um, when one starts a project, let's say, to yes. try to think and analyze. What would you consider or what would be your suggestion uh, to, to people starting a project like this, right? Like bearing in mind this trajectory, bearing in mind mm -hmm. your experience, mm -hmm. should they yeah. focus more perhaps in the one third of the challenge first? Should they focus entirely just on the prototype and try to accommodate uh, their solution based on this or, or perhaps another stage? What would be yes. your suggestion? That's a great, great question, a very important one. And, and uh, first of all, very much defining the challenges where you want to spend a lot of time, uh, which more than one might expect. I always like to think of and discuss uh, the word problem solving. Think of that word. It's in English, at least it's hyphenated. And, and so, you know, it, it almost suggests that, that problems are solved uh, almost at, uh, immediately and easily. And of course, as we know, uh, unless it's a very trivial uh, problem domain, things to really understand the challenge is absolutely critical and very difficult to do. And so, uh, spending, uh, trying to suspend that uh, normal 
way that we might have that we we kind of know what it, the problem is and let's just get to it and solution quickly it, it if done too early it can be dangerous indeed you you do want to get to the stage where you're experimenting and doing a lot of solutioning portfolios of solutions but the early stages i can't emphasize how important it is to really iterate and spend a lot of time up front on that define the challenge cool thank you thank you michael for 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 that input um indeed it's always i think more challenging to focus on problems than on ideas right we always get excited of ideas and not necessarily yeah. the problems but i, mean, I agree ideas. fully agree with your comment um then going to to one of the questions that was asked um Thinking on in the case study that you show us about M M M Pesa, um, the success, let's say, of this solution was not replicated, let's say, in other developing countries, uh, not only in Africa, but for example, also in, in other continents as well, as you were showing us. Do you think the time plays a role, meaning, for example, the current state of globalization or even, you know, living in a year where digitalization perhaps was accelerated. Do you think that actually play a role or may have played a role for this scaling or not scaling situation? Yeah, very much so. I mean, time in two in a couple of different ways, actually, if I if I think of it pre COVID, uh, what what's important to understand is that uh, the timing of the innovation and the understanding of what the innovation means, uh, let's say, for example, to uh, uh, the rapid success of, in Kenya, what it might mean to other banking sectors in other countries can raise issues or lobbies of, of how uh, banks may, may be very protective. And you always learn that a couple of a years after. So indeed, it, when, when Mpesa tried to go into India a couple of years after the Kenya success, there was some resistance at that time because of the timing of the innovation, the understanding of its potential disruption. Now, another angle that I think you were hinting at, Matthias, is that in our current pandemic, where we have, uh, you know, uh, things are accelerating, um, there's an increased need. There's, a, there's, there's increased opportunities for trying things out faster, uh, safer. It, it needs to be, of course, safer, but. But we, I've seen certainly in, in many different sectors, including healthcare, where I also do quite a lot of work, the, the, the willingness to experiment and the, 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 sh the, the shift in mindsets that, that have been unlocked, uh, whether it's permanent or not, is something to be seen. But it does help with the whole uh, innovation journey uh, um, in terms of what you, we can achieve in, a, in an accelerated time. Great. Thank you. Thank you for, for those comments. And then actually uh, correlated with that, uh, you mentioned when when trying to go into India, let's say there was some more resistance, actually, because perhaps the technology was a little bit more well known. Um, we had a question related, like, do actually traditional banks, you think, thought on a hostile way from MPISA when trying to scale, let's say, so like meaning being concerned that you will, let's say, perhaps take some uh, users from them or like, uh, yeah, seeing it as an as a economic threat to, 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 to their oh, yeah. own, let's say, portfolio. Yeah, no, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, the, the, the disruptive effect uh, plays out over time. And, and when, it, when it becomes really, anything that becomes very successful attracts a lot of attention. And indeed, in, in the case of M-Pesa, you've got a very, you, it, interesting situation because you've got a mobile network of operator that is providing what what banks would see to be their turf so you get an even more challenging um, uh, situation and indeed mpesa had to uh, sort of was challenged as to whether they were banking product or not they would argue that they weren't because they didn't attract any interest on their their products they were a, a mobile money transfer but that was de de denied or it was challenged right in, in certain jurisdictions uh, so indeed, a lot of a lot of competitive pressures and a lot of uh, protection, which you can understand as to whether to scale or not, and and that then creates the the real issue of how does um, MPES in this case build collaborations and cooperation with potential uh, you know um, competitors or who, people that would entities that would see them as competitors. Cool. So. And just perhaps as a last question, we're a little bit um, over time, but 
what projects or suggestions or techniques would you recommend actually uh, going back to your first comments uh, on the importance of engagement and understanding the local concerns and the use the local context sorry and the the users do you have any particular uh, approaches that you would suggest to young people to actually engage in that and, and by that Matthias, you're looking if you're talking about methodologies or yeah appro uh, tools yes. that, that can help tools, them, yeah. methodologies indeed. yeah indeed i mean there are there are so many and many variants i would say so i i, I have a particular uh interest and passion and, and belief that you know design thinking and design sprints adapted always is adapted for the the actual context and what you're trying to achieve um, can work really well. Um, I, we've been doing over the last year, actually accelerated by the pandemic, uh, online distributed uh, sprints, um, which are, uh, you know, if you'd asked me three years ago, I'd have said, well, no, of course you wouldn't want to be doing that. Uh, that's not the, the right approach. It's uh, face to face and, uh, you know, it is an important part of it. But we have seen, you know, great strides in, in how it helps build collaborations across different groups and, and, and to scale the ideas and to scale the, uh, you know, uh, the understanding of the context actually can be uh, quite very fruitful. Uh, of course, complemented with the face to face when one can do it uh, is going to be absolutely essential. But there, the, so I would say the, uh, the, the look out for, for how you might use the power of the technology to support uh, the collaboration, the scaling and the distributiveness of the innovation process. Uh, not, uh, I just emphasize again, not I'm saying replacing uh, the, the critical importance of, of getting into the physical realm as well to, to best understand um, what the innovation is that will help drive a good service. Cool. And actually, a uh, very, very short last question then. Uh, do you think with the current situation or that we are facing and living, would governments become more open to innovation and digitalization, particularly thinking on the need for upgrading or fast, uh, making faster regulations with all this new world coming? Yeah, I very much think so. And I think even just pre-COVID, and it depends on the jurisdiction of the country, I mean, we are seeing, uh, certainly in the UK, uh, much more use uh, and openness of, of technology uh, and, and engagement in an open innovation way by regulators with, with innovators. And that's a big step, if you like. Um, of course, it's our earliest days, but but the, I think that direction of travel is, is, is going to increase. And it's partly, as you say, accelerated and precipitated by the crisis. Uh, but I, I am, I'm optimistic that, that quite a bit of it will be learned from and adapted and used where it's appropriate and where it, it, it was not done because it was the only way uh, to, to achieve it. And sometimes that's done even if it's uh, you know, uh, not appropriate in a crisis mode, I should argue. Thank you, thank you, Michael, for, for your great insights, for your lecture, for your time. We appreciate it. it's late in the UK right now. Um, so thank you, everyone. 